I would not be surprised if you turn to the person next to you and say, what is this guy doing here? After all, TED stands for technology, entertainment, and design. I was a history major. <laughs> I don't know what these people are talking about, so wish me luck. History majors out there, of course, and you guys are probably almost laughing right now, but there you go, you get the jokes. Uh, my engineer and roommate used to refer to my history major as pre-unemployment. Thank you very much. <laughs> the seniors aren't laughing at all now, by the way. <laughs> and their parents, nothing. <laughs> history majors, be strong. Next time someone asks you, some B-school guy or engineer asks you, history major, do you like that? I used to say, no, I hate it, but the money is too good. <laughs> It's all about the bling, man. <laughs> and the other question you're really sick of your senior year at Michigan, of course, is when they tell you, history major, what do you plan on doing with that? Here's your answer. You look them straight in the eye and say, I'm going to join one of those large history firms in New York. You got the joke faster than they did. By the time they get the joke, you are out of that conversation. Wait a second, there are no, wait a second. That's their problem. History major, I love history, and I really love it when it's well taught. Unfortunately, too often it's poorly taught. It's taught as though individuals don't matter and moments don't matter, as though some huge glacier comes in and slowly goes out and we don't matter and moments don't matter. That is simply false, and I can prove it. You people here today were not inevitable, none of you. You beat all kinds of DNA odds just to exist in the first place. And I got some freaky news for you. Your parents used to be single. They had choices. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable, isn't it? They were single once, too, like you, and had all kinds of possibilities. You do, too. You see their lives as inevitable. They, they don't. They knew how many decisions they made. History was never inevitable. You go back in time, what do we learn about the Civil War? Well, of course, Lincoln freed the slaves, and they won the war, and things got better. All right? How many of you guys have seen the movie Lincoln? Exactly. It's great. Uh, it was not that way. Lincoln beat all kinds of odds just to free the slave, with all kinds of strength and courage and wisdom, and then to win the war. None of this was guaranteed. Individuals matter, and moments matter. Do not forget that. All right? The history was not inevitable at all. Going forward. Not only do we do a bad job of history, we do a worse job predicting the future. Because not only do we subtract individuals and moments from the equation, we subtract human nature altogether. I got some news for you. I've been watching a lot, all right, watching you people. Human beings have acted like human beings for a very long time. All right, that may come as news to some of you. All right, here's a bold prediction right here at the TED conference, Power Center. I'll give it to you right now. Human beings will continue to act like human beings long into the future. The internet was created, by the way, for professors to share the research. How many of you are on Facebook? All right? It was not created for that, but we have to be together. That's how we act. All right? We have to be together. How often do you hear that uh, in the future, not that far from now, 10, 15, 20 years from now, places like the University of Michigan are going to be gone? Bricks and mortar will be replaced by your laptop. You will download your education and hit send, and there you go. I can disprove that right now. Walk across the diag, you'll see a place called Ashley's Pub. Never been there. <laughs> my, my parents are here, man. I gotta be cool. <laughs> be cool. <laughs> you walk into Ashley's, you pay a few bucks for a pint. That's been going on for centuries, by the way. Ben Franklin, his bars in Philadelphia, I could take him to Ashley's. He'd have no problem figuring out what's going on. Next door, maybe some of it. <laughs> Next door, you got the Diag Party Store. You can buy your beer for far less there. Beer stores are relatively new, about 100 years or so. All right, you buy your beer there for half the price. You can walk home and drink it yourself, which is kind of creepy. Don't do that. <laughs> but that is an internet education. All right? We don't go to Ashley's for the beer. The beer is cheaper right next door. We go to Ashley's for the people. We have to be together. We have to be together. I can take Beethoven to Hill Auditorium last month where Yo-Yo Ma is playing his beautiful cello, and he would have no problem knowing what's going on, and we packed the place. I could take uh, Humphrey Bogart to Michigan Theater to watch Casablanca, we packed the place. I could take Fielding Yost 80 years later down to Michigan Stadium, and we packed the place. Everything I just mentioned, 
m uh, music, movies, sports. You can stay home and it comes right to you. You can either get it online or just turn on the TV and see all of that. We don't have to go to any of these places. So why do we go to these places? Because we need to be together. That has never changed. All of you here today, by the way, all right, you guys all paid 10 bucks. This thing's online, all right? <laughs> I don't want to tell you that now, I don't want to lose my audience here, but there you go. You could all be at home, you could all be on North Campus, whatever else. We're all here now because we need to be together. Shakespeare himself could be sitting where you're sitting, and a few years ago, the Royal Shakespeare Company plays right here on this stage, and Shakespeare would know exactly what's going on, all right? This thing is the oldest thing in the world. Man on stage talking to audience, that's Greeks, Romans, and Egyptians. We are still doing this. We don't change very much, all right? Now, with that in mind, We've already sized up the past and the future. That's pretty good for eight minutes. That's not bad. <laughs> pretty efficient class here. <laughs> we get these things wrong, so we forget about individuals mattering, moments mattering, and in the future, we have to be together also. I'm going to tie this up with a good story from about my favorite story, Jackie Robinson. As you guys are probably aware, Jackie Robinson was the man who broke the color barrier in 1947 of baseball. He'd been around forever. But what you don't know is how big a deal this was and how it hinged, like could have gone either way, like emancipation, like the Civil War, you name it. What happened? In 1945, by the way, one of the, one of the myths out there is that Lincoln frees the slaves, they win the war, things get better and better and better, Barack Obama, all right? <laughs> I spent four years here learning all the stuff in the middle, by the way, so. There's quite a bit in the middle. George Will, I interviewed him for the story I wrote on Jackie Robinson back in 97, uh, the famous columnist, and he said, from 1865 to the time Jackie Robinson comes up to bat for the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15th, 1947, things got demonstrably worse for African Americans and race relations in this country. All right? They got worse. They didn't get better or gradually. They got substantially worse. Jim Crow laws became legal with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. The Supreme Court says that's perfectly fine. Go ahead and do that. Jim Crow laws, the KKK, does not shrink. It expands in the 1920s and the 1930s. The FBI had to kick the KKK out of the Indiana state government because they were running the entire state. They were not getting better. They were getting worse. And one guy, Branch Rickey, a proud Michigan Law School graduate who coached the baseball team while in law school and graduated in two years, a pretty smart guy, all right? He decides this has got to change, and it's changing on my watch. I'm going to make this change. And his other owners, I've got lawsuits against him. He is getting death threats when this idea becomes public. All right? He knows it's scary, and he knows it's dangerous. So for this to work, he had better pick the right guy. Who would be the right guy? Most folks would think, get the best player out of the Negro Leagues and a guy who's probably a pacifist and won't talk back. He goes to the exact opposite, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson played at UCLA football, basketball, track, and baseball. In football, he led the league in scoring. In basketball, he led the league in scoring. In track, he set the NCAA record for the broad jump. In baseball, he hit .097 with 10 errors. <laughs> he was the worst guy on the team. And the UCLA is not exactly the Yankees either we're talking about, all right? He willed himself to learn baseball. With Buck O'Neill on the bus, the Kansas City Monarchs, he was talking to him every day in the front row of that bus. He willed himself to become a great baseball player. He was still not top 10, though, not in the Negro Leagues. But something else about Robinson that Ricky really loved. He was not a pacifist. He was an angry man, <laughs> truly. All right, angry man with all kinds of good reasons to be an angry man. In 1944, as a captain, in the U.S. Army during World War II, he's got his uniform on. You know he's a captain. He's sitting in the front row of a military bus. And the bus driver tells him, son, you, got, you can't sit there. You have to sit in the back. Robinson refuses 11 years before Rosa Parks. He refuses. For <laughs> you can't coach that, can you? <laughs> we'll be doing a little renovation here in the next five minutes or so if that's cool with you people. <laughs> Timing's a little off, but we'll figure it out. All right? Uh, he refused to go back. He was court-martialed for this. Court-martialed. He paid a serious price. That is serious business. That is the guy that Ricky wanted for this experiment. So he invites him up to his office at 215 Montague Street in Brooklyn, New York. And he invites him in, and Ricky uh, Robinson's got no idea what the subject is. He sits him down in a chair, 
And he says, I plan on breaking the color barrier, and I want you to do it. Robinson is flabbergasted. He can't believe that this is even a possibility. No one's talking about it. Can't believe that he's the guy he's going to pick. He's the best player on the Kansas City Monarchs. He said, but there's a catch. If you decide to do this, if you decide to do this, and he starts walking around him, if you decide to do this, waiters will tell you you can't eat here. Hotel clerks will tell you you can't stay here. Guys on first base, they're going to tell you every name in the book. You're going to deal with all that, and pitchers are going to be throwing fastballs at your head, and back then there's no batting helmets. All you have is a wool hat. That's it. It is a dangerous, scary experiment. And then he says, puts his fist three inches from Robinson's nose, and he says, what are you going to do when someone wants to haul off and sock you in the face? What will you do? And Robinson's agitated. His eyes are ablaze. And he looks up and he says, Mr. Ricky, are you looking for a man who lacks the guts to fight back? And Ricky says, Mr. Robinson, I am looking for the man who's got the guts not to fight back. On that moment, because of those answers, your world changed forever. U.S. history, world history, all changed at that moment because of those two individuals. The next year, the next year the military was desegregated, not before Robinson, then the schools, then Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream, Civil Rights, now Barack Obama. <laughs> Obama has said many times, and rightly so, there's no way he'd be president of the United States in 2008 were it not for courageous, bold, visionary pioneers like Martin Luther King. Well, get this. Martin Luther King has said, direct quote, I could never have done what I did if Jackie Robinson had not done what he did first. From 1865 to 1947, nothing but bad news. From 47 to Barack Obama, it's all sparked again. Why? Two guys, one room, one moment. Do not tell me that bold individuals like that will not matter in the future and change our future. Do not tell me these moments are not going to exist. These opportunities exist in the future. Do not tell me that history and the future, don't tell me the future has already been written. I know it hasn't because you are going to be the ones who write it. You are the individuals. The moments are in front of you. The future truly is yours. Grab it. Thank you.